Hello and welcome to this critical care teaching video, the second in our series of videos on hypotension and shock. In this case, we're going to be focusing on treatment. We're going to break this down into treatment for heart rate, stroke volume and systemic vascular resistance. Because, as you'll remember hopefully from the first video, blood pressure is a product of heart rate, stroke volume and systemic vascular resistance. In terms of heart rate, you must have a 12 lead ECG for your patient, or at the very least, some telemetry rhythm strip type monitoring, because you're gonna to need to treat the cause. That could be pharmacological therapy, or it could indeed be pacing. Heart rate is governed by the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. An intrinsic heart rate is approximately 110 beats a minute. This is kept in check by the parasympathetic nervous system. Most of us are under constant vagal stimulation to keep our heart rate low. When it comes to treating bradycardia then, the first thing we can do is to block parasympathetic activity. Now this might be removing parasympathetic stimulation. The parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus in particular, innervates most of the abdominal organs. And as a result, dilatation of those organs, such as the stomach for example, can cause a reflex bradycardia. Placing an NG tube and decompressing the stomach can be enough to remove parasympathetic stimulation. We can also use muscarinic receptor antagonists to block parasympathetic activity. Atropine and glycopyrrolate or glycopyronium are very short acting drugs that will induce a temporary blockade at the muscarinic receptor and therefore allow the heart rate to rise. The other thing we can do is augment sympathetic activity. This may be using beta adrenoreceptor agonists, such as isoprenaline. However, it's commonly seen as a side effect of other drugs like adrenaline and salbutamol, for example. And finally, if these drugs are not proving useful for your patient, pacing will be the final option. This can be transcutaneous, however, that will require sedation as it is painful temporary pacing wire or indeed a permanent pacing system. Tachycardia can also cause hypotension. You remember from the previous talk that extremes of tachycardia can prevent left ventricular filling and therefore reduce stroke volume. In addition, acute fast AF and removal of the atrial kick and atrial filling of the left ventricle will also reduce stroke volume and therefore cardiac output and so blood pressure. Acute fast AF and pulsed ventricular tachycardia with adverse features such as hypotension should be treated by a synchronized DC cardioversion. We can also use rapidly acting antiarrhythmic drugs when patients are not so hypotensive such as intravenous amiodarone or intravenous beta blockers. When it comes to treating stroke volume, we must treat the cause. Hypovolemia is probably one of the most common causes of a low stroke volume within intensive care, in particular in trauma patients with bleeding or fluid losses through burns or severe diarrhea and vomiting. We also see cardiac failure contributing to poor stroke volume and indeed obstruction to blood flow, such as a pericardial tamponade or a pulmonary embolus. Hypotension due to bleeding then. The key is to turn the tap off, stop further losses. That may be due down to uh, you applying some direct pressure to a wound, a temporary tourniquet, splinting of a long bone fracture, placing a pelvic binder in the case of open boot pelvic injury, or liaising with the interventional radiology team or surgery to help turn the tap off. We must go on to replace what's been lost as well, and that's not just red cells, but plasma, including fibrinogen, and platelets as well. And in many cases of bleeding in intensive care, tranexamic acid can prove useful. Fluid losses through burns or other uh, causes, again, treat the cause. Stop the burning, cover the burns, and give fluid. There are many equations that you can use to calculate how much fluid to give a patient who suffered an acute burn. 
Remember the possibility of underlying trauma and bleeding in cases of burns as well. In terms of other fluid losses, if it's diarrhea and vomiting, again, treat the cause. Is there an infection doing that to the patient and replace what has been lost? That's often using a balanced crystalloid solution. And again, in cases where there's a poor stroke volume, treat the cause. Is it due to an acute coronary syndrome? Do they need to go to the cath lab and have a PCI? Have they had an acute PE? Do they need thrombolyzing? Is this cardiac tamponade? Do they need a pericardial drain? Cardiomyopathy has a wide range of causes. Sadly, not all of these are reversible. With acute coronary syndrome then, the key is revascularization. And that's usually these days through percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI. This will allow a diagnosis of the culprit lesions and potentially treatment. It's important when these patients come back to intensive care that we provide secondary prevention, and that's going to be in the form of antiplatelet agents, a beta blocker, statin, and an ACE inhibitor, unless there's any contraindication to those drugs. With PE, systemic thrombolysis, or indeed catheter-directed thrombolysis, is recommended where there are adverse features of hypotension. Some centres are using angiojet. This is clot breakdown by catheter placed within the vessel and a directed high pressure saline injection and aspiration of clot remnants. Cardiac tamponade, diagnosed by echocardiography, is treated by pericardial drainage. This will not only be therapeutic, it will also allow you to make a diagnosis for what caused the tamponade in the first place. Additional treatment options in cases of heart failure and cardiomyopathy are positive inotropes like dobutamine, adrenaline and milrinone, and mechanical assist devices like the intra-aortic balloon pump and direct left ventricular assist devices. Additional therapies may be required for patients with cardiomyopathies, such as ACE inhibitors, diuretics, nitrates, vitamin replacement, and indeed sepsis treatment with source control as sepsis is an increasingly recognised cause of reversible acute cardiomyopathy. Systemic vascular resistance then. A low SVR is classically seen in two scenarios in intensive care, septic shock and neurogenic shock. In septic shock, I encourage you to follow the sepsis care bundle, giving antibiotics, oxygen and fluids to your patient and taking blood cultures and measuring lactate and urine output. Source control is key here as well. In terms of replacing fluid, this is currently a key component of sepsis care. However, our understanding is evolving, and if you're following the intensive care literature, you'll have noted findings that most septic patients are not hypovolemic at the presentation, they're just very vasodilated. And there is some evolving evidence that suggests excessive positive fluid balance worsens outcome in intensive care. However, the sepsis care bundle has not changed, and I would encourage you to follow that. Vasopressor medication in the form of alpha adrenal receptor agonists are an important mainstay in the management of septic shock. Where I work, noradrenaline is our first line and vasopressin our second line vasopressor. But both of these drug needs, drugs need central venous access. Metaraminol, is a less potent vasopressor, but it can be given peripherally and can provide you bridging therapy until central access and noradrenaline infusion is available. In neurogenic shock then, we are seeing a loss of sympathetic vasomotor tone. And this classically occurs in cases of spinal cord injury as a result of trauma usually, or indeed temporary sympathetic blockade due to neuraxal anesthesia and analgesia like spinals, or subarachnoid blocks and epidurals. This will often manifest as postural hypotension. In spinal cord injury, this can be a long-term problem, but many patients do regain some vasomotor tone. In these cases, we will need to ensure that no other cause of shock has been missed. In spinal shock, if the patient is unable to feel anything below a certain level, it's quite easy to miss trauma. These patients need to be kept well hydrated and they may need vasopressor medications. However, it's not unusual 
to find patients with multiple problems of heart rate, stroke volume, and systemic vascular resistance, all causing hypotension at once. And your treatment of them may be directed at all three determinants of blood pressure at the same time. This is the art of critical care medicine. And this can be a very difficult balancing act in some cases. In summary then, we've looked at some of the causes and some treatment options for hypotension and shock as a result of problems with heart rate, stroke volume and systemic vascular resistance. I hope you've enjoyed this short video and if you do have any questions or comments please do leave them down below. I hope to see you on the next one.